1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 12. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. As you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, uh, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. First Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12. May God bless the reading of God's word. First Thessalonians 2, 7 to 8. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Here, Paul summarizes what Paul, Silas, and Timothy did when they brought the good news of Jesus Christ to the people of Thessalonica. Paul preaches at the local synagogue for three Sabbaths. He proves from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul's message is so inspiring that not only the Jews come to faith in Jesus Christ, but there are also some Greek-speaking people, including some prominent women who are saved and come to faith in Jesus Christ. We learn from Paul that when it comes to sharing our faith in Jesus Christ with others, it involves more than our mere words. Our character and actions should also speak for Jesus. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul and his friends shared their lives with the Thessalonians. Paul also says that the motivation behind all their efforts is their love for the Thessalonians. Paul also tells them that in their ministry, they aim to please God and not flatter people. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 to 6. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Paul and his teams are apostles, missionaries approved by God and entrusted with the gospel, the good news. Their main obligation is to be obedient to God, who tests their hearts. At the end of the day, it is God who sends Paul and his team to Thessalonica to share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. God is reaching out to the Thessalonians. The message that Paul presents might not be a popular one for the Jews at Thessalonica. Paul preaches the message that their religion, 
and Old Testament practices of circumcision and food loss are fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. As Jews, they may carry on these practices, but they are not to impose these religious practices on the new Greek-speaking convert. The new church community at Thessalonica consists of both Jews and Greek-speaking people. God is creating a new people. The church is the new people that God is creating. Before Paul and his team reached Thessalonica, they are at Philippi, where they also shared the good news of Jesus Christ there. And this is how Paul begins 1 Thessalonians 2. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been, uh, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 2. You will read the story of Paul's experiences at Philippi in Acts 16. Paul cast an evil spirit out of a slave girl. Uh, the evil spirit gave this slave girl powers of fortune telling. As a result, her owners dragged Paul and Silas into the marketplace and complained about them. The magistrates put Paul and Silas in jail. At midnight, God sends a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison are shaken. The jailer takes his sword out and is about to kill himself as he's responsible for the escaping prisoners. Paul tells him not to do so. All the prisoners are still there. Paul then shares the good news with this jailer. Acts 16, 29 to 31. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and felt trembling among, before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Even in jail at Philippi, Paul speaks of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, when Paul and his friends come to Thessalonica, they had already suffered persecution for their faith at Philippi. Here is a story of Ammon, who lives in a country in Central Asia. Five years ago, Ammon became a Christian. Uh, in the time since, he has faithfully worked in church ministry, leading the house church in his village and traveling to more remote areas to share the gospel. Despite a surgery that limited him physically, he had never ceased in his efforts to encourage the local church. It was about two months ago that a group of young men from the region came to his home and asked him about his work. We learned that you became a sectarian and pulled other people into your sect. Is that true or not? Amin took the chance to talk about his faith. He pointed out that the Quran talks about Jesus and explained Christ's sacrifice for the sins of humanity. He was told to stop practicing his faith, and then the group left his home. For a time, there were no further incidents. Sadly, in early August, Amin's house was burned to the ground, with the fire caused by lit gasoline. By God's grace, the, the house was empty at that time. Amin asked around, and witnesses said that they had seen young men climb over the fence into the yard. Upon reporting to the police, Amin was told that the fire was his own fault and that he should stop talking about the gospel. Though Amin is being cared for by church members, he is currently suffering shock and anxiety about the loss of his home. He is also worried for the safety of his family. There are still some countries in the world in which those who believe in Jesus are persecuted. Paul's experience at Philippi and Thessalonica still exists today. We must remember and pray for our sisters and brothers who live in such countries. There is a deep bond between Paul and the Thessalonians. 
Paul tells his sisters and brothers in the faith at Thessalonica that he doesn't want to exploit them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship we work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. What kind of exploitation is Paul talking about here? I believe it is more than just mere emotional exploitation. Paul and his team work hard at Thessalonica to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul and his team do not make any financial demands on the Thessalonians for doing so. Today, we have Christian communicators on TV or on the internet who ask for donations to support their ministry. There is a place for these ministries. They also share the good news of Jesus Christ um, using the mass media. However, we also have had some sad stories of such Christian communicators who did not live up to their television image and are caught doing questionable things. They did, did not live up to what they preach. This is a challenge for me too. I constantly ask myself this question. Am I practicing what I preach? Do I work at my Christian life both on Sundays and during the week? Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Paul does not want to put a financial burden on the Thessalonian Christians. During Paul's time, there was a trade known as tent making. Paul supported himself through tent making. Paul writes 1 Thessalonians from Corinth, where he meets Aquila and Priscilla, who are tent makers too. Uh, here is a story of their meeting together in Acts 18, 2-3. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Earlier, Paul used the metaphor of a caring mother to share his love for the Thessalonians. Now, Paul uses the metaphor of a providing father. 1 uh, Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. As Paul reminds the Thessalonians of the God who is reaching out to them, he uses two parent metaphors. God is the caring mother. God is the providing father. It is this God who calls Paul and his team to share the good news of Jesus Christ at Philippi and Thessalonica. The efforts of Paul and his team are at the direction of God, who is bringing his saving grace to the people of Thessalonica. God is reaching out to Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, Paul tells the Thessalonians that it is this God who calls them into his kingdom, and his glory. Paul, his team, the Thessalonians, and we are also called into God's kingdom and God's glory. God is also reaching out to us through his son, Jesus Christ, in our personal lives. Today at the end of the worship gathering, we will pray that the Lord's we will pray the Lord's Prayer, which is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And this is how the Lord's Prayer begins. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Paul uses the metaphors of a caring mother and a providing father here in 1 Thessalonians 2. God is our ultimate parent. Uh, this is how 1 Thessalonians starts. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 1. 
Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Our Father who art in heaven is also the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, he is also teaching us how to pray to his Father. In fact, we have the right to enter the presence of the Heavenly Father because of what Jesus, his Son, has done for us. Jesus dies on the cross so that we can enter the Heavenly Father's presence. Deborah has just recently lost her father. Uh, Father's Day is fast approaching. Deborah wonders how she is going to cope with this loss in her life. Here is her story. Father's Day was fast approaching, filling me with apprehension. Uh, there would not be the usual Father's Day celebration at a restaurant with conversation and laughter. My father had died during the year just six weeks after he was diagnosed with cancer. Thinking of his absence churned the waves of grease and as memories washed over me. I recalled the heart-wrenching sadness and resignation in my father's voice when he informed me that he didn't think he was going to live long. I rejoice for my father's life in eternity, but I miss his presence in my life. Yet, as I progress through the stages of grieving, I find solace in God's word. Matthew 5 verse 4 comforts me as I read that those who mourn will be comforted. My sadness and anxiety on Father's Day led me to pray, and I asked God to help me cope with my feelings. God responded by leading me to Psalm 68, verse 5, where I read that God is father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. I wept with gratitude. Scripture opens the door to heal our brokenness by revealing to us God's truth and promises. Our Heavenly Father will never leave us or fors nor forsake us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. God watches over us and guides us through our grief and mourning. I will never be fatherless on Father's Day. God has assured me of that. Jesus entrusted his life to the Heavenly Father as he went to the cross for us. Now it is because of Jesus the Son that we can have a relationship with God the Father. May we also learn to entrust our lives to God the Father as we meet all those challenges of life. Amen.